Hi, I'm Steve Schindler. I'm Katie Wilson Milney. Welcome to the Art Law Podcast, a monthly podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The Art Law Podcast is sponsored by the law firm of Schindler Cohen and Hockman LLP, a premier litigation and art law boutique in New York City. Hello, Steve. Hello, Katie. How are you? I'm pretty good, but um, I hear you've been up to some exciting art law adventures. Maybe well, you can tell our listeners. I have. Actually, uh, last week I was asked to go to Madrid by an organization called the ADA, which is a Spanish organization located in Madrid, consisting of participants in the art world, mostly in Spain. I address them along with my co-presenter, Antonia Bartoli, from the Yale University Art Gallery, on the history of Nazi looting and Nazi restitution, particularly here in the United States. And I, uh, I spoke particularly about the various restitution cases that have been making their way through the U.S. courts since the late 1990s, including a couple that are still pending today. What's interesting about it was one of the main cases that is pending today, which you know about, is called uh, Kisira versus Thiessen Boromitsa Foundation. And Very that is impressive a, pronunciation. I bungled it at the presentation. <laughs> I tried really hard, but I confess that I kind of stumbled a little bit. But anyway, more importantly, that's the case that is now went up to the Supreme Court and is back in the Ninth Circuit and it involves a claim by the heirs of Lily Casira involving um, a work by Camille Pissarro that was certainly without question looted during um, the Nazi regime, appropriate for what we're going to be talking about partly today. And that work now sits about a kilometer away from where I was giving the address. So, of course, it had a lot of relevance to the people that I was talking to. But I think it went really well. My co-panelist, Antonia from Yale, also did a marvelous job. And I understand from talking to people in the audience that there are a number of listeners of this podcast. And so I both want to thank the ADA for having me and to thank all of those listeners for continuing to listen to the podcast. That's amazing. Yes, thank you, Spanish listeners. We are grateful for every one of you. (laughs) So today, Steve, we're going to be giving our listeners three museum-related updates. So Steve, give us your update first. Sure. Well, two months ago, on August 10, New York Governor Kathy Hochul signed into law an act to amend the New York education law to require museums to post notices regarding displayed art stolen during the Nazi era in Europe. As a very short law, and it says, I'm going to quote it because it's very short, it says, every museum which has on display any identifiable works of art known to have been created before 1945 and which changed hands due to theft, seizure, confiscation, forced sale, or other involuntary means in Europe during the Nazi era, defined as 1933 through 1945, shall, to the extent practicable, prominently place a placard or other signage acknowledging such information along with such display. And that's the statute. And this applies to every New York museum? Every New York museum. Now, this law was part of a larger package of amendments to the education law relating to the Holocaust. It includes enhanced classroom education involving the Holocaust. It also includes a directive to banks to offer favorable rates to Holocaust victims. And, of course... The guidelines enacted in the late 1990s by the Association of Art Museum Directors, called the AAMD, and the American Alliance of Museums, AAM, have called on member directors and museums to identify Nazi confiscated art and make their archives open and accessible. This is consistent with the 1998 Washington Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art, adopted by 44 countries who attended the Washington Conference on Holocaust-era assets. Now, of course, those existing guidelines are all voluntary, and now we have a law compelling museums to act. 
And while this law is well-intentioned, there are still a lot of questions about how it would be complied with and how non-compliance will be enforced. So one positive aspect of this law is the very broad definition of the art involved. And while the Washington principles and the museum guidelines speak only of, quote, confiscated art, unquote, this statute is considerably broader and applies to art which, quote, changed hands due to theft, seizure, confiscation, forced sale, or other involuntary means. And we know that the Nazis employed a wide range of techniques to force Jews to sell their art, often as a way just to leave the country. A great deal of art was taken under forced sales and other means that were designed to look like voluntary transactions, which they were not. So the statute broadens the definition of confiscated art, which existed in the Washington Principles and the Museum Guidelines, to a more realistic notion of how art changed hands between 1933 to 1945 in Nazi-occupied Europe. But the statute is silent as to who at the museum makes the decision that a work changed hands due to one of these articulated reasons. Is it a curator? Is it a director? A board committee? And by what process is that determination going to be made? Keeping in mind that a number of museums, including both the Met and MoMA, have litigated the question of whether a work was sold under duress with the Met recently winning a case against the Leftman heirs in Zuckerman versus Metropolitan Museum of Art. Which we talked about on this podcast. We yeah. did. And so museums have been at times aggressive about contesting even the question of whether or not there was a seizure. In the Zuckerman case that I just referenced, one of the questions was, was the sale made under duress? And the court concluded in part that it was not. Also, the other question that it raises is, who's going to enforce a museum's non-compliance with this law? <laughs> right? Great question. So a couple of possibilities. Presumably, the New York Attorney General's office, which is responsible for supervising nonprofit organizations, could be uh, charged with enforcing the law. It's not specific in the statute. And most New York museums are also subject to regulation by the New York Board of Regents. Could be them too, I suppose. The law doesn't indicate who will enforce it and what process will be put in place to identify noncompliance and then to adjudicate any disagreement over whether a work falls into one of the defined categories. Now, it's also worth noting that this statute applies only to works that are, quote, on display. Ah. and does not extend to all works in a museum's collection. So to that extent, it's narrower than the existing museum guidelines, which ask museums to publicly, to make available provenance information about works in its entire collection. The voluntary guidelines, yeah. Correct. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting point, because, of course, one way around this is just to not put something on display, and museums have a lot of objects and paintings that are... Most, probably. ...that are not on display. So that's one, perhaps, loophole in this. And finally, some commentators have raised the possibility that this will create a disincentive for museums to research a questionable work because the law applies to works known to have changed hands, et cetera. And of course, if a museum doesn't know a work was taken by the Nazis, then it's not obligated to label it. I mean, it's a pretty cynical view, and I'm not sure it's a, a correct view, but it's, again, a kind of oversight, perhaps, in the law. And as of this date, none of the major museums in New York, as far as I'm aware, have released any guidance on how they intend to comply with the no, law. No, they're probably not sure. Right. I have a, a lot of questions on this, Steve, which may I'm not sure surprise our listeners. First being, why now? I mean, what is happening right now that a law like this comes into effect? That's a good question. I just um, wonder, you know? Yeah. I mean, as I said, this was part of a, a kind of larger effort to address a variety of educational issues yeah, pertaining the to the Holocaust. And, you know, I'm sure some of it's political political. 
There were a number of sponsors, or at least co-sponsors. Anna Kaplan was the sponsor of the bill, but a, a range of co-sponsors. So, you know, this is the, certainly the kind of thing that um, I don't want to be too cynical about it, but it doesn't hurt politicians to sort of be behind something like this. And also, again, because there's no, it's such a vague statute. Yeah. It doesn't cry out how much it's going to cost and, again, how it's going to be enforced. So it's, it's almost just like a, a, a proclamation. Yeah. And, in fact... Um, there's a little justification in the bill, and it goes through the history of Nazi looting and how it was designed to enrich the Third Reich and integral to the Holocaust goal of eliminating all vestiges of Jewish identity and culture. And so I think it highlights, of course, what many people already understand about the Nazi regime's very extensive efforts to strip Jews of all of their assets, including their art. But, of course, this has been uh, talked about for many years, right. um, you know, starting in 1991 with Lynn Nicholas's book, The Rape of Europa. And, and we talked about it, you know, in our podcast with Nick O'Donnell, which right. our listeners can go back and listen and to. And Nick, who wrote a, a really authoritative book yeah. on the subject. So I, I can't answer the question as to why now exactly, except that it was part of a number of statutes to have our education law focus on this issue. My take listening to you explain this is that its power is really in its symbolism, but that its legal effect may be extremely limited. I mean, and for one, the statute relies on terms like forced sale and you know, coercion that have been litigated in New York for many decades, right? These are like hotly contested ideas that even the brightest jurists and lawyers differ on and can't agree on. And the idea that, you know, some museum curator is going to be able to determine if a sale qualifies as a voluntary sale or not, and is even going to have access to the information they need to make that determination just seems very unlikely to me. I think it's entirely unlikely. And also, we've seen cases where, as I said, museums have hotly disputed uh, yeah. whether a work is... There's is regularly litigation. ...eluded. And, I mean, in some ways, when you think about it, we talked about the case of the Norton Simon Museum and the litigation over the pair of the Adam and Eve uh, right. panels uh, by Lucas Kronosh, the elder. This was a case brought by Marais von Seher, an heir of uh, Jacques and Desi Goudsticker. We talked about this case, I think, when Nick was on the podcast. Clear that this work was looted. There's no doubt that the work was looted. And the Norton Simon litigated this case very vigorously on the theory that the actions of the Netherlands Restitution Committee at the end of the war were somehow definitive and required to be followed by... Basically, the heirs couldn't have a second bite at the apple. Yeah, and, you know, that there's, there's a lot of disagreement over whether they correctly applied the doctrine. But I think in my head for a moment, oh, what if California had this law and you had to put under the Cronosh, Adam, and Eve panels, this work was looted, or words to that effect, it would be a very powerful thing. Of course, the Norton Simon would undoubtedly not do that because of the position that they've taken, that the work, uh, in effect, was not looted uh, for or technical was, or reasons. Or was looted, but that was, the heirs have no recourse. Correct. Yeah. So I think this raises more questions in many ways than it answers. I think you're right. It's a symbolic act, a good symbolic act, I suppose, but how it ends up changing museums' behavior, at least museums that are already uh, have signed on for a number of years now, to a voluntary obligation to do what this statute compels more, them to do. Or more, actually, to research. And to do more. And to restitute. That's right. That's right. And I just point out, too, that those AMD and AAM guidelines, you know, museums sign on to them, but, and I, you know, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the resource constraints of these institutions, but they're not followed. I mean, every museum that's a member of AAM and AMD is not doing exhaustive World War II era provenance research on every piece that might have changed hands, you know, the end of the 30s and the 40s. It's just not happening. And one reason it's not happening is that they don't have the staff for that. They don't have professional researchers, and it's not part of their budget to hire outside people to look at every work. Now, I think they do that as problems come up, 
we have seen that because this is revealed in many lawsuits where the research is done. But, you know, there aren't people doing this at every museum. So they're not even following these voluntary guidelines to the letter. Right. Yeah. All right, Katie. All right. Tell us what's going so on. So we're going to move away from the Holocaust, but we're going to stay with museums, as I said, and the AAMD. So we've talked a lot on this podcast, and I've talked in other places a lot about the deaccessioning rules, norms, and uh, in New York, laws about deaccessioning in the art museum context, which just means, again, the disposal of works of art from a collection. And when and how that is allowed to happen, and also how the proceeds of that disposition can be used, which is hotly contested. So the Association of Art Museum Directors, AAMD, what we'll call them, which is a membership organization made up of art museum directors that sets industry norms and standards, just like the Holocaust research-related ones we were just talking about, has long had a policy on deaccessioning in art museums, as have other ethical membership organizations like AAM as well. And AAMD's policy on deaccessioning had particular teeth, and it's been very controversial because it's been very strict. So the guidelines for deaccessioning that AAMD has laid out for all its members, which are basically all the important art museums in the country and some in Canada, um, have been the same since 1981. And they state that you can deaccession for certain limited reasons that support the integrity of the collection, like there's duplication in the collection, or work is damaged, or not representative, but the funds from deaccessioning could only be used to purchase new artwork. That's it. Not operations, not capital expenses, no other purpose, just buying new work. So when certain member museums like the Delaware Museum or the Berkshire Museum, which I'll also reference to prior podcasts if our listeners want to learn more about those examples, when those museums deaccessioned art to pay for other things, uh, like operational or capital expenses, they were sanctioned or expelled from AAMD, which on the one hand is not a legal organization, what's the big deal, but on the other hand meant that those museums no longer could interact in important ways with their peers. They couldn't get loans, there was no cooperation among museums, so it actually is quite harmful. Now during COVID, which of course we're still in, but during the early days of the pandemic, AMD decided that it was going to change its approach to deaccessioning as part of an emergency measure to support its members during what many of them said was a real financial crisis. So in April of 2020, AMD issued a moratorium that for two years, until April 2022, it would not sanction member museums for two things, using restricted funds for operating expenses and, for this discussion, that it would not sanction member museums for using funds from deaccessioning for a broader set of purposes than buying new art. And they said, you could also use funds from deaccessioning for what they called direct care of the collection. Now, I just want to note that the press you know, has covered this extensively, and I just want to correct again that this was not a rule change per se. It was just saying, we will not punish you if you do this, which... Sure. Very lawyerly, I yeah, think. Which, of course, fairly is, is maybe a rule change, but that they technically did not change the rules. And this term, this idea of direct care, remained undefined in this moratorium by the AAMD, and it opened up a lot of flexibility of interpretation. So museums themselves were technically supposed to enact a board-approved policy that outlined what they meant by direct care, and that should have been publicly available. Not all museums did that. But the point being that museums could define that for themselves. And many museums said, well, everything we do at the museum is direct care of the collection, right? The janitor and the elevator repairman are like, of course they're here to protect the collection. That's how the art moves. We don't want it to get dirty. So things like salaries, some of the core things that we think of as operational expenses were justified as direct care during this period, and museums were allowed to kind of define that for themselves. But the AEMD, when it nervously enacted this moratorium, gave a pretty strict warning. It said, and I quote, this temporary approach is not intended to incentivize deaccessioning or the sale of art, only to provide additional flexibility on the use of proceeds from art that may be sold. AMD's long-standing principle that the proceeds from deaccessioned art may not be used for general operating expenses remains in place. So 
many museums. I think somewhere around eight museums sold blue chip art during this period, taking advantage of this moratorium, uh, including the Met and the Brooklyn Museum. And they did substantial deaccessioning, the proceeds of which were used in a pretty broad range of so-called direct care expenses, including salaries at both of those museums. And in other cases, you know, public programming and other activities in the museum. Now, this change or acknowledgement by the AMD that its traditional deaccessioning rules weren't going to fit the present moment opened up a big debate in the art museum world about whether those strict prohibitions on how cash-strapped museums could use funds from deaccessioning made any sense at all. And amid calls to review the rules Permanently, AMD did appoint a task force to look into this and examine and evaluate whether there should be permanent changes or alterations to its rules. And indeed, there were. So, Tell this, us about them. <laughs> in September, a couple weeks ago, AMD announced new guidelines on deaccessioning, which is, as I said, the first substantial update since 1981. And these new permanent rules allow proceeds from deaccessioning to be used for the direct care of artworks in the collection, as well as acquiring new arts. So that sounds like a pretty big change. And for the AMD, uh, which is a very conservative organization in this sense, it is. But this time, unlike with the moratorium, AMD took care to define and place guardrails around what direct care means. So it did not, it's not leaving this up to its members to define for themselves. And the rules say, Direct care for purposes of this section means the direct costs associated with the storage or preservation of works of art. Such direct costs include, for example, those for conservation and restoration treatments, including packing and transportation for such conservation or restoration, and two, materials required for storage of all classifications of artwork, such as acid-free paper, folders, mat boards, frames, mounts, digital media migration. So. It's pretty specific. But the most interesting thing about these new guidelines is what it says that these funds cannot be used for. Because it AMD knew, because it had watched what had happened in this two-year moratorium period, how broadly museums would seek to define direct care. So the new guidelines also state that funds from works that are sold may not be used for capital expenses or operating costs including explicitly the salaries of staff or the cost to mount temporary exhibitions. So this is unlike the more permissive pandemic era rules that let museums flexibly define what direct care would be. And this is a big limitation to the way many museums defined those rules. So, you know, 109 of 199 voting members approved this policy, 21 voted against it. And it does look like many directors who had been very much against the pandemic era loosening rules did support this because of the strict guardrails that were put around it. I you know, see. it's not the limitations, I agree, I think will make the slippery slope argument less worrisome because it explicitly says you can't pay salaries with this money. Right. And do we know who voted against these uh, regulations? I don't know on the, off the top of my head, but some directors have made statements that they did not support it. But some directors who have been very against loosening the rules did support it and said that they did so because of the guardrails that were put in place, that it was really a compromise measure. Right. It's interesting that this is sort of coming to the surface at the same time that some of the, um, the wage issues we see in some of the museums, particularly MoMA right now, are also coming to the surface. And, and it always just strikes me as one of these tensions here that somehow you can sell works of art to do certainly nar narrowly defined things, but if it comes to paying people, you know, for cash-strapped institutions, that that's just yeah. a non-starter. Well, I think the people who are wary of loosening the rules around deaccessioning would say, like, you're an art museum. Your goal is, your purpose is to preserve the art. That's what you do. And once you start using your collection as an asset that can be monetized, that goes on your balance sheet. It's like there's no real end to that. So I think it's wrapped in up in how we define what an art museum is and what it means to have a collection. But I agree with you. It's a hard argument 
for not the big museums in New York, but for smaller regional art museums who, as we've said many times on this podcast, were gifted incredible art that is now worth many millions of dollars in a time when there were wealthy donors in those regions, and there are not anymore, you know, when they have very limited fundraising avenues and serve a less advantaged population than the big museums in New York to tell them that, you know, they can't sell a work of art that's been sitting in the basement for 25 years to serve their community. You know, it's a tough argument, and that's what we saw coming out of the Berkshire Museum controversy, which we will not relive right now, but um, we've certainly talked about a lot. Is the AAM or the Alliance of American Museums, are they going to follow suit in any way? Or? They've always had that rule. So AMD has always been much stricter. They've been the strictest organization. AAM, FASB, and uh, the Regents' Rules in New York have been relatively aligned in that you're allowed to use proceeds from deaccessioning for direct care, and, and uh, AMD is still stricter than those organizations. We'll just say AMD is the only one of those organizations that applies only to art museums. And I think it's fair to note that, that there's something about an art collection that may be different from different types of collections um, with objects that you know, may be more transient or not as integral to the mission of the right. museum. So we'll see kind of what museums do with this new rule and if anything changes. I think we'll see also, I mean, as we, the economy shifts and, you know, who knows whether we're going into a recession or not going into a recession, but if things start to go sort of down again, you know, economically for some of these museums, they're going to be faced with the similar types of scenarios as, that they faced, you know, during the pandemic, maybe not quite as acutely, but... Uh, yeah, and I think we also, it wasn't just the pandemic. I think we had the pandemic and a marriage of a huge social justice push after George Floyd's murder in which members, not members of AMD, but, you know, employees and participants and patrons of these museums wanted the museums to be much more than art museums. And I think there's a fair debate about whether they're the appropriate venue to do much more. But they really were asked to engage with their communities in a different way, and they needed funding for that, and uh, they had a lot of expensive art. And I think that is not going away. We're also seeing big unionization pushes at museums. So there's the expectations for that employees have, that artists have, that, that visitors have for these museums is changing too, and that's, I think, creating some pressure. Right. And I think that leads us into your next yes. topic. Okay. So the next and last update is about the William Paley sale that MoMA is doing through Sotheby's this fall. So a foundation created by the CBS founder, William Paley, decided to auction off 29 of 81 masterpieces long on loan to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is the first time I should note that any works in this collection have been sold. So Paley, just a little background on Paley, he was a significant MoMA supporter from its very early days and a modern art collector at a time when modern art was absolutely not in vogue and was not something that a lot of wealthy patrons were interested in. He joined the MoMA board eight years after MoMA was founded in the 30s. He served as its chairman and president. And when he died in 1990, his extensive and quite impressive private collection full of paintings and sculptures by artists like Picasso, Renoir, Rodin, went into MoMA's care via a unique arrangement. Now, I'll just say on the sale, none of the works that are being sold are currently on view. So to our point about works being in storage, all have been in storage. And Glenn Lowry, uh, MoMA's current director, has said that Paley's most famous piece at MoMA, which is Picasso's Boy Leading a Horse, which is on display and a beautiful work, is still on display, it's staying put, absolutely not being sold. And the same with an iconic um, Matisse called Woman with a Veil. So not all of the works are being sold. Right. So certain breathe, breathing a sigh of relief. Yes. Well, the, the Picasso one I even remember you know, seeing yes. every time I go. But some of the works being sold are quite significant. So there's a Picasso cubist work that will be offered for at least $20 million in November in New York. And a Francis Bacon triptych will be offered for $35 million in October in London. And there are works by... Renoir, Moreau, Bonnard also being sold during these evening sales. In the those fall. are the estimates, right, that you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, those are the estimates. So they're going to be offered for at least that amount. The expected income from all the sales 
at Sotheby's is 70 to 100 million. So it's a pretty significant amount. A very small portion of this is going to go to Paley's Foundation to support its own causes, but the vast majority of the funds are going directly to MoMA. And MoMA is uh, integral in orchestrating the sale. Now, what MoMA wants from these proceeds, and the reason the sale is happening, is to create an endowment earmarked to support digital media, technology, and related acquisitions. So the funds are going to expand the museum's digital presence in many possible formats, which you know we're not sure of yet, but could be its own streaming channels, digital art, or NFTs, but kind of jumping into that world in a way that MoMA has not been able to. So why is this interesting? I think this is interesting because the relationship that Paley's Foundation had with MoMA is quite clever. So Paley's Foundation placed his collection with MoMA on a very long-term loan, the terms of which gave MoMA significant control over how the works would be used or disposed of. So not a gift, but feels gifty. Right. When you say dispose of, that means sold, right? Uh, I would assume. Now, I unfortunately have not seen the gift agreement, yeah. and if any of our listeners have access to it, please send it to me because I would love to. But what's been reported is that there is a significant control over the whole lifespan of the works in MoMA's collection right. as they sit in MoMA's so collection. So this is not deaccessioning in in the way that you were just discussing before because the museum never owned the works. Right. It, were, they weren't in the museum's collection. One might forget that MoMA doesn't own the works, but... It does not. So Paley's arrangement with MoMA, where MoMA has possession and significant control, looks a lot like deaccessioning, right? Which we just talked about. Here, MoMA directly benefits from the sales with substantial and relatively unrestricted income, and it parts with art that's been a functional part of its collection for decades. So sounds like deaccessioning, sure but it's does, not right. because MoMA's not the owner. The foundation is. Um, I feel like. You could call this backdoor deaccessioning, and I do mm. think, as I said, that it's quite clever because it gives MoMA a lot of flexibility. Clearly, here, the foundation and MoMA are entirely aligned, so there's no dispute about whether this sale can occur. They they're doing it together. Um, so the only issue is really public perception, and as we just said, typically there are a variety of legal and ethical rules with respect to actual deaccessioning, which restrict when you can deaccession something. You have to have a justification that's collection promoting. And it restricts the use of proceeds to the acquisition of new works or care of the collection, right? I don't think anyone, even in the most flexible interpretation, would say that uh, creating a huge digital media presence would be either of those things. No, I don't think so. So here, MoMA doesn't have to deal with any of those limitations. And uh, the foundation, which uh, Paley's son is still involved with, has confirmed that MoMA has pretty much free reign to do whatever it wants with the funds in the digital space. So the foundation's not managing it. You know, it's it's really just kind of alongside for the ride. So it's interesting. I mean, putting aside this particular transaction, for people who are sort of planning ahead and planning uh, their estates with large collections, it does open up an interesting door to loan your works to a museum, probably, again, through a foundation, because it will probably have to be set up that way. And then it, it gives the museum ultimate flexibility down the road, whether and when to sell the works and what to do with the proceeds. Uh, and all you have to do is, instead of donating the works give them a long-term loan. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is that most donors would never want to do that, right? Museums would always want this, and I'm sure they ask for it, but donors don't want that because they want to give their art to a museum and know that it's going to stay there and be displayed. They don't want to make donations. The museum's just going to sell and pay for salaries, right? Like, that's what donors want to avoid. So what's so interesting about this arrangement is the astounding flexibility in the original gift that we rarely see and perhaps a real awareness and, you know, generosity by Paley that understanding how times change and that right. he really trusted MoMA with this, you know, pseudo gift um, in a way that most donors will not. In fact, one of the major concerns with the accessioning, which I think is real, is that it discourages donors because they want their artworks going into a public trust, 
essentially, right? And they want to know that the museum's going to care for it, that it's going to be in a scholarly institution and available to the public and not being sold off into private hands. And, you know, it's not deaccessioning, of course, but the concerns and the worries underpinning the rules applicable to deaccessioning certainly apply here. I mean, we have these modern masterpieces leaving the collection of a major museum where now, you know, scholars can go research them. They could be on display. They are theoretically available to the public, and uh, they'll probably go into private hands. Right. So you trade a bacon triptych for an NFT. Ugh. <laughs> that makes me less sympathetic. But uh, it, is, it is a pretty interesting posture, and I think uh, it's, it certainly was a, a terrific arrangement for MoMA. Yep. So, Katie... Why would MoMA want to sell these works, some of which are obviously masterpieces, to get into the digital space? That is a great question. Uh, to me, this seems like a response to great pressure that museums are under to gain traction with younger audiences and new audiences and to stay relevant. And as much as I love an art museum, especially a modern art museum, I think there's a fear that these are somewhat archaic institutions in terms of how they approach audiences and are run uh, and are organized, and that in the pandemic there was this big push and response to digital presence in a way that museums really hadn't explored before, and I think MoMA feels like they really have to get on this train or they're going to miss it. So I think there's a real effort to stay relevant. Um, and, and also just the reality the pandemic presented, which is that online traffic is up, foot traffic is down. I think, you know, my skepticism, I think this could be very interesting, but if I'm going to be skeptical, which I'm sometimes prone to be, my skepticism would be around whether there's some mission creep here, which is that Right. It's not that digital access, or digital art, or perhaps even NFTs maybe aren't interesting or important, but I don't know that MoMA or museums like that need to be the places you know, to offer that type of art or experience. They may be best served and their visitors may be best served by being modern art museums where you can go see physical objects. So. Right. MoMA may be great at this, but they may not be, and maybe they're getting into something that they were, isn't their specialty. Right. And we see this also with a whole range of nonprofits that, uh, that feel the need to, to move into different areas, and, and sometimes it ends up diluting uh, their original mission, right. which is what they're good at. So yeah. I, I guess we'll see. Yeah, we will see. And that's it for today's podcast. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and send us feedback at podcast at schlaw.com. And if you like what you hear, give us a five-star rating. We are also featuring the original music of Chris Thompson. And finally, we want to thank our fabulous producer, Jackie Santos, for making us sound so good. Until next time, I'm Katie Wilson-Milney. And I'm Steve Schindler, bringing you the Art Law Podcast, a podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The information provided in this podcast is not intended to be a source of legal advice. You should not consider the information provided to be an invitation for an attorney-client relationship, should not rely on the information as legal advice for any purpose, and should always seek the legal advice of competent counsel in the relevant jurisdiction.